Do it. Maybe it's too early. Basically, the framework that I'm talking about is, uh, you know, D a divisor on a surface. And D is effective. Then I can write down this exact sequence, OS of minus D goes to OS goes to OD. So this is just taking s functions on the surface S and restricting them to D. And there's a kernel which is a sheaf of ideals. And then if D, uh, I'm thinking of D as effective, then if D is A plus B also effective, then I have this uh, O A plus B goes to O of B comes from O A of minus B. Right, and then there are you know lots of lots of games you you play with this. <coughs> Lots of, and so I described some of these games. Uh, so you know, a lot of this is sort of basically, basically very easy. Just uh, so you, you, you all remember when we, when we talk about Riemann rock on curves, we think about what happens if I take a divisor on a curve and I take away one point, and basically you get the same kind of thing. But we're on a surface, so the cur the divisors themselves are not simply points; they have geometry of their own in their own right. Okay, so I want to I want to continue talking a little bit about uh, Duval singularities, but uh, but slightly more generally. So uh, so let me um, uh, especially especially they can be contracted. So uh, I should say curves m minus two curves can be contracted. So the thing I have in mind here is. Duval singularity. So I've got a, uh, a surface with a few, a, a few of these little Duval singularities. Then we've we've seen in some cases, and you can see in general, that you can have a resolution here with a bunch ci. So ci are each individual ci has minus two, and ci is isomorphic to p p p one. So these are minus two curves. And then the whole bunch has an intersection matrix CICJ, which is negative definite. <coughs> right, so the, these are Duval singularities. And these are bunches of curves. Uh, bunches of minus two curves. So I want to go, uh, I want to go, I want to also be able to say that I can go backwards from this to this. Uh, in, in order to be able to have a surface on which I can try to prove uh, uh, that the multiples of the canonical bundle are very ample. But for the moment, let's just, uh, uh, let's just sort of talk, talk a little bit generally about the situation. So the index theorem. So if, uh, if, D, if H is, has H squared positive, then... Uh, H times D equals zero implies D squared is zero. Uh, D squared is less than or equal to zero. Usually, usually less than zero. <coughs> but if uh, if D is effective, if also D is effective, then um, so H squared then then D squared is definitely negative and uh, so if uh, so in particular so 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 the cor the corollary of this the cor corollary of this is so suppose i've got a, a, a morphism phi x uh, s2 let me write y here and i'm th i'm thinking of this as being projective in, in contained in some projective space Th this one's non singular projective And I'm, I'm thinking now in the case that dimension of y is 2. So I'm not interested in just contracting the whole of s to a point or contracting s to a curve. If I, if I bring s over a curve, I'm thinking of... Uh, uh, so if this happens, then I can write phi upper star of h 
uh, phi up the star of O of 1. I can call this H, right? So, uh, you, you know, here's, here's my surface. Here's an attempt to embed it in projective space. So it's mapping to some other surface in projective space. So here I'm in... Here I'm taking all the hyperplanes there and I'm lifting them back and they're, they're giving this linear system there. Then H is nef and B. Right? H squared is the degree of phi times the degree of y. Degree of y is a, a sub-variety of projective space. And H times any curve gamma is... Uh, the degree of phi of gamma restricted to gamma times the degree of the image phi of gamma. Right, and this is, the, both of these numbers are greater than it. Uh, so, so the point is that this could be zero. Right, it's zero if gamma, if phi of gamma is a point. Right, anyway, this number is greater than or equal to zero. Right, so, uh, uh, if I think about, so h times gamma equals zero, if and only if phi of gamma is a point. Right? And then, so the index theorem says that, uh, this, the, so, so these are now effective curves. They aren't, they aren't just sort of abstract divisors. They're effective curves. So then uh, uh, this implies that this um, the set of gamma with h times gamma equals zero is negative definite, is, um, has negative, is negative definite. It means that gamma i, gamma j is a negative definite matrix. Right? And so, you know, you could also prove this a slightly different way. You could say, well, let's take all the points here points of y so, uh, such that a curve of s contracts to a curve cu curves of s contract to p and then now I can uh, choose a I can take some divisor in there take a divisor of pn Through passing through uh, all these points, t t take a, a hypersurface through all these points, right? So uh, I've got a uh, maybe I've got some curves here, and they get contracted down, for example, all to this point. Right? Usually, usually the points like that will be singular points. They don't have to be, uh, <clears throat> right? Uh, and then, uh, so then, I, if I call if I call this H, then I do uh, you know the map phi up a star of H. Now certainly contains all the contracted curves. Right, so it's the form. It's of the form phi up a star of h equals sum of n i gamma i plus sum h primed. So this is uh, uh, no common components with the gamma i. Right, so if I have this, then uh, what do I know? Well, uh, h times gamma i is zero because they're contracted. And uh, h primed times gamma i is greater than or equal to zero. Right? Because the h primed has no components in common. And sometimes, sometimes greater than. Right, so uh, we here, I have, we have to know that this divisor here is uh, as a as a set is still connected, right? So, so if if we know that it's connected, then this this guy has got to meet these guys. That's h prime greater than or equal to zero. 
So I'm not really going to go into why that, why that is. I think it's uh, not completely trivial. But, uh, okay, and so uh, and so then this implies that. Um, so now if I take sigma ni gamma i times all of the gamma i, this is negative, and for all i, and less than zero for some i. Right, and you, if you work at this a little bit, uh, let, let's suppose that this connection. Let's let's suppose that the bunch is connect, bunch of curves is connected. Just just for simplicity. Uh, right, then uh, this implies again that gamma i gamma j is negative definite. Right, uh, so you know this is an effective divisor. So this, this effective device, the only way it can hit some curve gamma i negatively is, first of all, this gamma i squared has to be negative, and then the gamma i has to be contained in there. And then, you know, if you divided these, these curves up somehow or other into two sets, you'd get similar arguments. So I'm not, I'm not going into this. It's, it's sort of basically easy and then contained in several of the textbooks. Okay. So uh, the conclusion of this, you know, proposition... Uh, contracted curves are negative definite. Okay, so um, uh, so I mean, I, I, uh, this 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 proof here saying it follows by the index theorem is is complete. The proof I'm giving here is something where you'd have to do a little bit of work to finish it. Contracted curves are negative definite. So I want to uh, raise the following question. The answer is not, not no in general, but let's ask the question anyway. So if I've got a bunch, if, uh, if uh, let's say, ci on S is a bunch of curves with negative definite, intersection matrix then is it true that you can contract them that there exists a contraction of phi from s to x with the sigma I, ci maps to finitely many points. Okay. Now, uh, you know, this, this is a slightly tricky problem. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to give you the idea that it's, uh, that it's very easy. But there's a, a good, uh, there's, uh, there's a good condition. That, namely, that the curves are rational uh, and, and I uh, this isn't this isn't uh, so th I have to explain what this means this isn't a you're not expected to know this immediately uh, which is a necessary which is a sufficient condition so uh, you know let, let, let me say straight away if I've got a curve like this so uh, uh, you know, if I, sorry, if I've got a surface like this and I've got some curve on it, gamma, even non-singular, non-singular, uh, and gamma squared negative, if uh, the genus of gamma is positive, then, uh, you know, it, it will happen, it can happen, that it can't be contracted, that no such contraction So uh, what I mean here is that these, that no no such contraction is possible. Exists. So in other words, no. So so you know the typical thing, and this is going to appear many many times. So you might as well see it. So if I've got if I've got P two, and I've got uh, C, it's traditional to take a plane, a plane cubic, non-singular plane cubic. So this is not, not 
rational curve. Right, if I, if I take if I take P1 up to Pd in C3 points, the general points, and the D is uh, greater than or equal to uh, 10, then, so I'm going to blow them up. Right, I make S1, uh, let me take S uh, to be the blow up of P2 in P1 up to Pd. Right, then this contains, S contains the proper transform of C. So there's a curve C in S that maps birationally to C. I mean, just think of it as P2 with these points deleted and then take the same curve C in it and then uh, just extend that to a curve in the blown up. Uh, the, the, this is called the proper transform or the birational transform of C. Right, then C prime squared is, uh, you know, the C3 squared, which was 9, is just the self-insection, this is self-insection of a cubic curve in P2, minus D, and this is negative. Right, but if I took these points general, then, um, then we know exactly pick of S, the blown up surface, and uh, there does not exist any divisor on S, any uh, which is not trivial, non-trivial, but uh, D restricted to C prime uh, linearly equivalent to OC prime. Okay, so, you know, very, very roughly speaking, if I want to see a curve on S, well, uh, it, it, I think it's not so rough, actually. It uh, can be made quite precise. If I want a, a, surf, a curve on S, I have to take a curve in P2, and then I have to say, specify that it passes some number of times through each of these points and subtract those off. So that's the only way I can find a uh, the only way I can find a, a curve on this blown up surface. If I've got a curve on this blown up surface, I can push it down in the plane, I can pull it back up again, and then what it looks like is a plane curve with some number of the exceptional curves over these subtracted. Right? So if I take any such curve and I res <coughs> if I take any such divisor, effective divisor, and I restrict it to the C3, then what I get is the hyperplane section in C3 plus some plus or minus some multiplicity of these points. If the points are general, then you know they're they're not linearly independent over Q as points in the divisor class group of C3. Then uh, then this can't then uh, there won't be any non-trivial divisor on S, which is trivial on C prime. Right. Uh, so you know this is a this is a sort of bad counter example. This is Zariski called Zariski's counter example. Right. On the other hand, if the curve, if for example these are 12 points which are the intersection of C with the quartic, then you blow up those 12 points and you can obviously contract the C3 using, using, the, uh, using the special property of that quartic divisor. Right. So in other words, um, you know, if we, if we don't have this sufficient condition, which I'm going to explain, then you know, the question about whether or not the gamma can be contracted depends not just on the numerical specification of S and gamma, but also on some kind of you know, basically tricky analytic properties of the, of the neighborhood of gamma. So you know, this, is a, this, is a, this is a tricky, uh, a tricky problem in general, and uh, you know, uh, a problem where we know counterexamples in general. But so, I, so we definitely need a condition here. <clears throat> okay, so, so what's the condition going to be? <clears throat> so this is, a, uh, this is work of 
Mike Artin um, uh, around the 1960s, in the mid-1960s. So, um, uh, so let's CI, let, so, so let me start again, CI a bunch of curves. non-singular S <clears throat> and let me say connected it doesn't it really doesn't make any difference if it's got several different connected components you just treat the separate connected components separately right then um, then I say that uh, the, the the CI the bunch CI is rational uh, and I, I'm going to connected bunch of curves with negative self intersection negative definite intersection. Then CI is a rational, this is a definition, if uh, H1 of OD equals zero for all D sigma and I CI. And I positive. <coughs> okay. So, uh, so, 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 you know, let me let me just sort of give a, a fairly trivial example of this. Uh, so, if uh, if I've got P one and normal, uh, you know, uh, e is if e is P one and e squared is minus k. Then uh, it's, at a, it's got negative definite self-intersection. That's fine, uh, and you know the only divisors supported on it are n times e. And uh, you know we can take any. I can, for example, take O n e restrict to O n minus one e. You know I'm thinking of doing this by induction. Here I have O e of minus you know, the usual thing we had before in minus 1 e. Okay, so this guy is either positive or negative. Uh, we can probably calculate which. This is O of, this is e of minus e. So e squared is negative, so this is O e of some, something greater than zero. Right, and so h1 here is zero. And uh, we can uh, assume by induction To the induction starting with n equals 2 when I've got p1, so there's no cohomology here. By induction, h1 equals 0, and so therefore h1 equals 0 here. Okay, whereas, uh, so note that if I've got, for example, e isomorphic to p1 with e squared equals 1, of course it's not negative definite anymore, but then um, uh, 2e is isomorphic to a plane conic, so it's uh, it looks exactly like double line in the plane. It's uh, you know it's uh, a scheme which everywhere locally looks like a double line, but where where the self intersection, the intersection of the, this is determined entirely by e, the intersection of e with e inside. So the degree of the normal bundle here. Is plus one, then this is uh, this has h1 of o2e equals zero. Very good. And then if I take three e, this is isomorphic to a plane cubic, and h1 o of three e is definitely not equal to zero. Right. And so you know you can. All of the, these uh, these conditions are sort of amenable to calculation. <clears throat> so, what do we want? What do I want to do with it? What do I want to do with this? So, uh, there's quite a lot of stuff about this already in the Park City notes. So. Um,
So this, uh, uh, as written, as I, as I write this condition, it looks, it looks like it's cohomology, right? And so uh, uh, you, can, you can check that this uh, bunch uh, CI is rational if and only if PA D is zero for all D is sigma and I C I. Okay, so, so let me let me just explain this. P A D is uh, K D K S D plus D squared. Uh, I'm sorry, you know it's uh, two P A D minus two is equal to this. Or well, the P A D is uh, uh, one half of K S D plus D squared. Plus one. Right. So this is uh, this is just. Uh, 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 so how do you prove this? So the P A D. Is of course uh, P O D is H one O D minus H naught O D. I'm sorry. That's the wrong word. <coughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry. You've got to keep uh, uh, watching me because I'm just otherwise I can lie. Right. So if uh, if H one if H one of O D always zero. Then P A of D is always less than or equal to zero, obviously. Uh, right, but conversely, if uh, if uh, P A of D, so if what I want to say is is this that if uh, H1 OD is not equal to zero, then there exists some smallest, some smallest D, some minimum D that supports a cohomology class, H1 OD. Right, so this means that so suppose I've got something, uh, suppose, you know, this is the standard trick that algebraists are always using. I suppose I've got some group that's a counterexample to something, then there's a smallest one, right? And so then this means that there, there exists a D, so it's, you know, some sigma and I, D, I, C, I, such that H1 O D equals zero, not equal zero, and, um, H1 O D primed equals zero for all D primed smaller. Right, and then you can check. Um, so I'm not quite sure if, I'm, if I can remember how to do this immediately. I can read this out of here if you want, but so. Uh, <coughs> This means H1 D minus gamma uh, is equal to zero for all gamma in D. <coughs> and then just think about, so I'm going to look at H1 OD. I mean, I mean as I said, I'm, I'm playing this standard game again and again. I'm really doing just the same thing there. Comes from, what's it come from? It comes from H1. O gamma of minus d plus gamma. Right, and so so this is this 
sort of, you know, minimum, minimum. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm trying to prove that, uh, I'm trying to prove that PA, PA of D is less than or equal to zero for all D implies that H1 O D is also zero. Right, and so then uh, that, so this one is not zero, and this one is equal to zero for all gamma, so it follows that this guy is not zero for all gamma. And then uh, say a duality on D, uh, on gamma, says, well, you know, I mean, just the obvious thing. This is uh, H naught of K gamma, so this is O gamma of Ks plus gamma, and then minus this guy, plus D minus gamma. Right? And this is going to, uh, this implies, this is, this holds for all D and ga all gamma in D. And this implies that PA D is greater than or equal to 1. <coughs> yes, this, uh, this is, this guy is not zero, and so therefore gamma times Ks plus D is greater than or equal to zero, and therefore uh, Ks plus D times D is likewise greater than or equal to zero. And that means the Pa is greater than or equal to one. <coughs> okay, so I mean, uh, I'm just saying tri uh, basically trivial things, things that everybody knows. So, um, I, I hinted here that there's a result here, there's a main result, that we're going to be able to contract curves. So, uh, con this is Artin, Artin's uh, contractibility criterion. So, gamma i... Uh, let, 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 let me say ci. Let ci on s. I want it to be negative definite and rational. Right, uh, negative definite means uh, all the ci, the ci, the matrix ci cj is negative definite matrix, and uh, rational means this condition here. Okay, then. So S here is a non-singular projective surface. Then there exists a morphism uh, phi from S to, let me say, X in Pn. So I want, um, I want uh, phi is isomorphic embedding outside outside the gamma the ci uh, I want that phi contracts all the connected components of union CI to different points of X. And uh, uh, let me say I want OX to be norm, uh, uh, X to be normal. I'll, I'll, I'll explain how, what, what you have to do to get this. This is not a big deal. X normal and this, this means that um, uh, that um, local rings of X uh, or the affine coordinate rings of affine pieces of X are integrally closed. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, this condition. It's also called uh, integrally closed in its field of fractions, and this is also called Stein 
factorization. So this means that uh, O x is phi upper star, a phi lower star of O s. Okay, I'm, uh, so I mean this is sort of slightly technical and basically it's not the most important thing, right? But there is a there is a little thing here. At some point you will in your if you take have a career as an algebraic geometer, there will be a time when people say Stein factorization to you and you're supposed to know what it means. Right, so I, I will explain. I'll explain that what what it means later. <coughs> so a particular case of this is Castelnovo's contractibility criterion. So a particular case. is if uh, C a minus 1 curve on S, so this means that C squared, C is isomorphic to P1, and C squared is minus 1, implies that there exists uh, a morphism S to S1 taking C to a point uh, isomorphism, isomor so I want this, isomorphic, isomorphism of S minus C to S1 minus a point. Right, so I'm just saying what these three points mean here, and P in S1 is non-singular. Right, so this last point needs a, just a tiny little bit of proof. Right. And another case, and the case I'm more interested in the moment, uh, also, if C i is a bunch, uh, let, let me say connected always, so they're just so connected bunch of minus two curves. Sorry. Uh, then, um, then they contract to uh, a, Duval, a Duval singularity. Right, so this is the thing that I really want for my uh, canonical models. So what we have to do, uh, what we have to do, is uh, find a suitable divisor d on. Uh, so uh, uh, let me so, uh, let me say a suitable divisor l on S which is uh, ample outside the CI and zero on the CI. And this, uh, so, so this means that L times CI equals zero, this sort of obvious uh, numerical criterion that you can want here. So I'm going to want more than this. I want, I want more than this. I want that L restricted to D is isomorphic to OD for all D equals NICI. Okay, so this guy here is just a, a lin, uh, just a numerical condition. This is just a, a condition you can get you get from playing around with the quadratic form of intersection. So there's an intersection form on the surface. L times C i is some numbers. I can mess around and so on, and eventually satisfy this. Right. Uh, this condition here is is basically what it's telling me is I've got my curve here C. So maybe C looks like this. Right. The thing I'm drawing here is sort of 
infinitesimal, but I'm really thinking of it as a tubular neighborhood. So this is a, a, a D is sufficiently fat. infinitesimal neighborhood of uh, union of CI. Right? And what I want is that L is still trivial when I restrict it here. Okay? So, uh, uh, how much time... Okay, so uh, did I say this? Uh, yeah, okay, this is my cartoon. <clears throat> so uh, my cartoon before this had this uh, description of the Picard group. So we're going to come back to these algebraic groups obtained as divisor class groups on singular varieties. Uh, you know, I mean, this is, this is simple material because I'm only trying to prove that the guys are zero. So it's a little bit simpler than the stuff I had uh, yesterday, when, last time when I was talking about Ramanujan vanishing. <clears throat> so, uh, so what is... What is H... One of a D multiplicative. <coughs> so you know, there's a there's a thing here called there's a thing. So, so this is the set of the the group of isomorphism classes. of line bundles on D. Right, so this is also called pick D. And you know, the, uh, the, the, the picture is basically exactly, exactly the same as the one I had last time. So here's D. You know, think of it as, you know, when I'm drawing these curves, think of them as being sort of hairy things, slightly furry, furry things. They've got these infinitesimal, no potent things coming out of them. Right. But what I want to say is, let's take a union of two open pieces, then pick D as a set of line bundles. So a line bundle is L restricted to U1 is trivial, OD restricted to U1, and the same thing with U2. Right. And then I have to glue them together on this open piece, glue together by transition function in. Uh, so the transition function is in uh, H0 of U1 intersect U2 and then O D multiplicative. Right? It's just a, it's an isomorphism from a line bundle uh, to another line bundle, and that means it's an element of the multipl multiplicative group. You know, it's a one by one matrix with coefficients in OD, and it's a non singular matrix. It's not allowed to vanish anywhere. Yes? And so if you take the set, the set of all of these, and you up to suitable equivalence relation, the thing you get is this H1 of OD multiplicative. Right? <coughs> so, uh, um, Artin has this uh, remark, and you know this did, did appear basically in the other time. So suppose that D is A plus B. <coughs> right, and suppose that suppose that B is greater than A. Right? So in other words, in other, i.e. B is greater than one half of D. Right? Then I do my usual thing trick of writing O D, restricting to B, and then I get ask the guys who are zero on B. Right? So this is OA of minus B. 
Right, so we use this sequence in different ways. At different times I've used this, saying this guy here is a line, line bundle. Line bundle on A. Here I don't want to say that. Here I want to say it's an ideal in D. It's an ideal in the sheaf of rings OD. Right? It's the ideal in D of things that vanish on B. So, you know, think of it as I, B contained in D. Right? And the point is that IB squared is zero. Yeah? So that's exactly this condition here. <coughs> So, so what? So, uh, you know, we can... I, I'm, I'm trying to describe H1 O D multiplicative. Right? So I can take this and restrict it down to H1 O B multiplicative, and I get a certain kernel. At the same time, I can take, also take H1 of OD and restrict this down to H1 of o, 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 OB. And I also get a kernel. And the point is that these kernels are isomorphic. And they're isomorphic because, uh, you know, I could take OD and map to, try to map from OD to OD multiplicative using the exponential map. So I'm going to take some functions in here to there. So that's the standard multi, uh, ex exponential exact sequence that you can use in uh, complex geometry, local analytic sheaves of, uh, uh, sheaves of local analytic functions. Right? Well, I don't want to do that. What I want to do is I'm, I'm taking functions here which are in the kernel of the map OD to OB. So if I want to think of, uh, I want to think of these functions here. And what I want to do is, so I, you know, something in this ideal is an F. Right? And I can take 1 plus F, and I can take the exponential of 1 plus F. And this is 1 plus F. I'm uh, very sorry. I'm very, very sorry. I want to take the exponential of f. Right? So the expo exponential of x, as everybody knows, is 1 plus x plus uh, x squared over 2 plus and so on. But all of these guys are 0. Right? Because, exactly because of this. Okay, so, so, so look, let me, let me try to make one thing completely clear. This guy here, and the things I had last, in last lectures, H1 of OS multiplicative, you know, you spend, uh, you spend, as a graduate student, you may spend three months trying to figure out what's in Hutch on Chapter 3 on coherent cohomology groups. And uh, the thing you've got to be completely clear about, this guy is not a coherent cohomology group. Right? If you want, it's incoherent. Right? It's not a coherent cohomology group. So, you know, you have all that nonsense about quasi coherent sheaves and so on and so forth, foundations of algebraic geometry. And then, you know, the first time you actually need something, you find a group, well, this is, a, this is certainly a sheath of groups on S. And H1 of it, the thing I described here, is certainly a well defined cohomology group, sheaf cohomology group but it's not a coherent group, right? So the guys on the bottom line here are coherent groups. This one here is just H1 O A of minus B. <coughs> Co coherent cohomology group means, in particular, it's a finite dimensional vector space over the ground field, right? Whereas these here, these things here are groups. They're interesting groups. In, they're groups in their own, own right. They're algebraic groups. They have in interesting for lots and lots of reasons, but they're not coherent groups, right? And so, so Artin's, uh, Artin's, res Artin's result is, says that <coughs> <coughs> it 
So if h1, so this uh, condition rational, so this is by definition uh, all h1 od are zero, and this implies that all the groups h1 od multiplicative are discrete lattices. In other words, I take L in H1 of D multiplicative, a line bundle, right, then if L times, uh, if, if degree of L on every curve C is zero, implies that L is isomorphic to O D. Right? So that's exactly the point I was making here. Exactly the point I was making here. Here I've got this scheme D, which is maybe sort of has this kind of you know, fur growing on it all the way, nil potents all over the place. It's a sort of fat infinitesimal neighborhood. I take a line bundle here and I restrict it to D, and yet if I, there was, I was making this numerical condition here. So here I have a numerical condition, and here I have this a priori analytic condition, that, that, the, that the line bundle is uh, trivial uh, on, trivial as an analytic uh, line bundle on some neighborhood of the curve, right? And so the point is that this condition rational here is enough to guarantee this. I mean, it's sort of basically also obvious that you get the other way around, right? So, in other words, I'm doing this thing. I'm doing H1 o, OD multiplicative, and I can uh, take this into z to the power of rho. Rho is the number of rho is the number of ci's, right? By line bundle L maps to uh, the, the L times ci, which is the degree of L restricted to ci. Yeah, or, you know, I mean, it's also the gen first gen class map, if you want. So when, when D is a reduced curve, if, D is a, if, D, if I've got down to the reduced curve and I can't play this trick anymore, then I would have a line bundle of degree zero on the curve, a connected curve, and then this rational condition, this PA equals zero condition, implies that L has a non-zero section, right? So if, um, if D is reduced, let's say, let's say D is equal to sum of the CI, all with multiplicity one, then uh, PA of D equals zero implies that, uh, and this is just riemann rock implies that H naught of L is, uh, let's say it's connected, is uh, 1, and so there exists a section, and the section is an isomorphism of O, D, isomorphic to L. Right? So, uh, you know, this is, uh, I'm saying there exists a section, so there's a non-trivial homomorphism from O, D into L, and then if it's connected and uh, all this stuff, and so on. Then this uh, this guy, and the and the L has degree zero on every component. Then uh, it's got to be non-zero on some component. That means it's non-zero everywhere on that component. It's an isomorphism on that component. And then if the if the divisor is is uh, connected, then uh, <coughs> then we have this OD goes to L. Right. But then, if I think about what happens when I now take this reduced D and I let it get fat, so for example I take twice the reduced divisor, then the kernel here is a coherent group. And it's a coherent group and it's, it's zero because this group is zero. Right? So, uh, so rational, the definition of rational was all of these H1 of ODs are zero. And therefore all of these kernels are zero. And therefore all of these kernels are zero. 
right? And then, so when I'm reducing the first step at the reduced step, I'm taking line bundles on a reduced curve, uh, and uh, the reduced curve is itself a rational curve, and that means if the line bundle is of degree zero, it's uh, actually isomorphic to the structure sheaf. And then we, can, we extend this out to fat, to fat neighborhoods in the same way. Okay, so maybe... Uh, okay, so should I...